our next panel about the emergence of platform regulation. Hand in hand with the growing success of platform businesses um, comes an ever growing demand for regulation. And as a backdrop for this panel, our moderator, Max Beverton Palmer, director of the Internet Policy Unit at the Tony Blair Institute, will walk us through the top findings of a recent study where um, he's contrasting people's perception of existing regulation of key industries, and that obviously includes social media, and how people think those industries should be regulated. This will no doubt spark an interesting conversation with, the with, with his fellow panelists. Um, and before I twist my tongue even more, Max, over to you. Hi Petra, thank you for that introduction and welcome everybody to this panel on platform regulation. Uh, so as Petra said, I'm Max Beverton Palmer. I'm director of the Internet Policy Unit at the Tony Blair Institute. So we're a not-for-profit that's set up to support leaders um, and governments around the world um, to build inclusive, prosperous, open, progressive societies. And we in the tech team at the Institute believe that the tech revolution is the central challenge of our time and that the change makers in our society, the platform leaders, the platform experts who are really changing our world at the moment need to have a better dialogue and conversation with those making the laws. And thankfully, we have an ex excellent panel coming up, um, experts from across this tech policy discussion. Uh, and I'll introduce them after my short presentation on some research we did last year. So um, if you're like me, you probably go to dinner parties or you go to uh, Zoom, Zoom dinner parties now and all you discuss is platform regulation or the Digital Services Act or the Digital Markets Act or the Furman Review. Um, but obviously a lot of people aren't like us, platform experts, but they, that's not to say they don't still have a view on whether these companies, these kind of platforms should be regulated or not. Um, so I'm going to share with you a study of um, a work we did last year of 20, a 25 country survey on globalization and globalism, where we asked some specific questions around tech regulation. So this was um, a collaboration that the Institute had with YouGov. As I said, 25 countries um, around, uh, around the world, um, a study over uh, it's a, a survey, online survey between July and August. Um, and we found some really interesting things when we asked people about what they thought industries were regulated, how they're regulated today, and how they should be regulated in the future. So we asked um, wh whether people, we asked people to put um, certain industries on a spectrum of whether they should be wholly run by the government or all the way down to whether there should be no specific regulation, and then we could compare those. Um, social media and online search are our proxies for the platform economy here. Um, maybe not perfect proxies, but I think they still give us a good indication of where people perceive regulation should be around the world. Um, and so um, I want to show you a bit about um, kind of what people thought about regulation of social media. Uh, I think you can see, interesting for me, people in Britain and the US had a particularly um, strong preference for regulation of um, social media. So this is people who answered whether that there should be regulation of social media rather than no or they didn't know. Um, I think in general people were fairly uncertain about the regulatory futures they wanted to see. Um, and looking across a kind of range of industries as well, people in Britain, um, the US, France and Germany, um, people in uh, people in Britain were much more interventionist than other countries um, on a range of industries. Um, I'm not going to go through each of these countries in detail and we could have a fascinating discussion on Nigeria's social media law, for example, and what that says about consumers' perceptions of whether there should be social media regulation. On the other side, on online search, what I've got here for you is um, a slide showing people's preference for the, when people answered that there should be no specific regulation of online search. Again, kind of uh, Japan, its history of kind of liberal markets has a much um, uh, lower, a much kind of more support for no regulation. Um, and again, I think we see this um, throughout, the, throughout the study. Uh, people in Britain in particular were highly supportive of regulation of the platform economy. Um, 
I, one of these, this is a very complicated chart, but what this allows you to do as an example is to give you a bit of a kind of regulatory fingerprint of where people um, might perceive regulation um, to be and then where it should be in the future. And you can see the colored bars are where people think it is today and the um, transparent outlined bars are where people think it should be tomorrow. Um, and you can see more about this in our, in our study and all, all of the methodology, um, which we'll share the link around with you later. Um, but I think what you can start to see from this is that people have a different perceptions around the world of where regulation should be. Um, but that we found that um, platform regulation is actually fairly unique as an industry and people do perceive social media and online search as different from other industries. Um, but the regulation like this chart shows is, and um, this next chart on the UK example, shows that um, regulation is probably a little out of kilter for where it should be, according to the public um, conception. Um, so I guess in conclusion, and to kind of introduce the panel, I'd say that what our study shows is that this is a highly complex world where regulatory solutions um, aren't easy things to talk about and aren't easily understood. Um, but what we can see from this is that then there's a need for better collaboration, better cooperation uh, to find that regulatory sweet spot. And perhaps as, uh, as this panel can start to discuss how we can better co-create as a society of platform leaders, of platform regulators and of politicians, uh, how we can co-create better protections and regulations in the future. So with that, I will turn to our distinguished panel. Um, I'll ask them each a question in turn uh, and allow them to talk about where things are. And I think it was really interesting to see earlier the diversity of people we have. So we're not gonna get too much into the detail of specific clauses in regulation, um, but I would ask you to put in questions in the chat as we go along. So um, first of all, um, to, start, to turn to um, Stephanie Yoncotin, who is an MEP, who has the inside track on some of the le uh, legislation and regulation coming out of Brussels. Um, so uh, Stephanie, um, you've got extensive experience of all of these issues, both currently in, uh, as a, an MEP, but also at a national level. Um, can you give us an insight onto where, what the state of platform regulation, what the future of platform regulation looks like at the moment. Um, what's going on in the European Parliament um, and what are the key points of discussion at the moment? Thank you, uh, Max. Thank you for your invitation. And I'm very happy to be here to discuss this issue with uh, familiar faces from other webinars on, on the DMA and delighted to have so many people online from different countries, which definitely shows the global interest in this uh, digital platform challenge. Um, and I hope I'll be clear enough because uh, from what uh, you rightly pointed out, Max, uh, regulatory solutions aren't easily things to do and are not really easy to understand. So I hope I'll be uh, understood and clear. Well, let me start by saying that I very much welcome the true, true proposal of the European Commission, you know, on the DSA and DMA, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. In my last annual report uh, on competition policy, I was calling for, you know, an ex ante regulation uh, for systemic platforms, given the uh, identify loopholes um, of competition policy at digital age. You know, the European Parliament has been vocal for ages on this issue, starting with the Google Shopping case um, 10 years ago. Uh, but now we'll focus more on the Digital Markets Act. Uh, you know, the Digital Services Act is also a very important proposal because it aims to regulate online content moderation. Uh, DSA might be a more sensitive issue actually in the, in the European Parliament, because it, we have to strike the right balance between regulation, liability, consumer protection, and freedom of speech. So, and, and on some aspects such as transparency of algorithms and both proposals, DMA and DSA, will improve the current situation to address the imbalances regarding relations between gatekeepers, platform, consumers, and business users. So on the DMA, Digital Markets Act, where do we stand at the European Parliament? You know, that is the $1 million question you ask. Uh, both proposals are cross-sectoral issues, the regulation of 
online platforms touches upon consumer protection in the internal market, competition, sector regulation, data protection, and intellectual property rights, and so on. So it very uh, cross-sectoral um, uh, issue. So far, final decision on which committee within the European Parliament will be leading the file is still pending. It should be resolved by the end of this month, and we all agree that we need to get an agreement soon on the digital market. There is no time to waste because in you know, in this digital market, in the digital platform, time is of essence. At the same time, we should make sure that we design a future-proof efficient instrument. Regulation is good, but it has to be enforced properly to be efficient. So this cannot be done in two weeks. As the Commission, European Commission, delayed twice the announcement of the proposal, the European Parliament takes the necessary time to ensure that relevant committees will be able to work on this crucial file and provide their input. And this is normal procedure, but I understand it could be seen as contradictory with the urgency of the upcoming regulation. The DMA, Digital Market Act, aim to ensure contestability on online markets. The regulation has been drafted following past antitrust cases clearly identify, and we know that some practices, you know, harm competition, so we should ban them before they could even happen and not having to go through 10 or 15 years procedure to close a case. Also, our European antitrust toolbox is very much effective. We are not definitely well equipped, equipped to keep pace with uh, digital developments. Uh, and as we did in the telecom or energy uh, sector, we are doing it now with digital platforms that have reached such a position that they are able to impose their own set of rules and to decide on who will get access to the market, who will not. In some way, they could be considered as essential facilities, you know, and be treated as such. We are talking about a handful of companies, let's say around 10, the biggest ones, you know, the ones we cannot avoid to operate online, whether you are a consumer or a business user. Only these companies will have the very strict rules applied to their behavior and practices. Some would like to scare decision lawmakers saying that the DMA will prevent innovation. I don't think so. I think it will provide a level playing field for everyone and foster innovative services. As recalled, this regulation must be narrowed and will not jeopardize the whole digital ecosystem, but address only anti-competitive practices clearly identified. So this regulation does not come out of the blue. It comes after years of experience of antitrust procedures, case law and fines, high, very heavy fines, demonstrating that they are not deterrent enough and remedies that are not always effective to restore competition. Within the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, where I'm vice president, um, it will be a committee competent to work on competition. So I do hope it will have an important role to bring its expertise and ensure the smooth relationship between the DMA and the current competition rules. Within the Council of Ministers, actually um, under the presidency of Portugal, the Council and the ministers has already, have already started their discussion within its working group on competition. And I really hope that we could have entered trilogues in first semester of 2022. And if I am a being, being a, a optimistic, let's hope for a final agreement of the DMA under the French presidency, you know, which will be the next semester 2020, first semester 2022. Most importantly, we need to get this regulation applied as soon as possible. Finally, we will make sure to move forward quickly on this regulation as there is room for improvement. In this regulation, there are many uh, loopholes. Uh, regarding the definitions, the thresholds, the fine tuning of list of obligations and interdiction, the role of national competition authority, the time frames, and many other questions. I look forward to keep discussing with experts, industry, and consumer organization, and start talking with all of you. And thank you, Max. Uh, we definitely see that regulatory regulatory is one solution, but it's not everything. Great, thank you. That's an excellent summary of what's going on, hopefully very insightful for everybody on this session. Um, so I'm going to now turn to um, Professor Annabelle 
Gower, who has actually written a 150 page report for the European Parliament on online platforms. Um, and what this uh, report looks at is the effects of platforms on the economy and society. Um, so Annabelle, um, could you give us a summary of those 150 pages? Um, what should we be learning from it? What is your expert view on the future of platform regulation? Thank you very much. Yes, um, uh, and thank you for the organizers to this event. And thank you, Mrs. Stéphanie Yoncourtin for I thought these extremely helpful remarks. Um, it's very hard to summarize a 150 page report, which itself has a, was, was drafted on the basis of more, more than 400 references. I think the bibliography itself is 20 pages, but I'm going to try. So I've prepared two slides and I hope, I, and I will, uh, I will um, also put in the chat, the link to the report itself. And there is also a four page policy brief, which are all accessible from the European Parliament website for those who want to know more. So let me just share my screen and uh, please let me know if you see if you see it well. Yes, Max? Yeah, yeah. good. Okay, so I said two slides, so this one doesn't count, okay? Um, so, um, and so I'd like, I'd like to start very quickly to, uh, to, to say that, of course, we understand that platforms, um, online platforms create a lot of value. And there are very different types of business models, very different type of online platforms. Um, um, and, uh, but they do have something in common, which is they facilitate transactions amongst very large number of users uh, using the digital, the digital economy of infrastructure and they facilitate innovation in the sense that just like uh, uh, you know, uh, using APIs and, uh, and, and software developers kits, you have, for example, uh, millions of, of developers that can build on top of innovation platforms such as Android or, 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 or Apple iOS. Um, and obviously there are a lot of positive effects of platforms on consumers, on businesses and competition and innovation if they, and, and the success of these platforms is a testimony to the fact that uh, billions of, of individuals and businesses find them extremely helpful. Also, a lot of services are offered for free. In addition, um, um, the, the biggest online platforms invest significant amount of resources in R&D. Um, Google, for example, uh, invests about 15% of its revenue in R&D. In general, online platform firms invest about three times more than other firms in, in research and development. And that's all very good. And so I think it's important to, 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 to remember that. Now, moving on to the negative effects on consumers, businesses, competition and innovation, uh, there's been increasing uh, awareness of the centrality or the, or the position of, uh, as bottlenecks of a very small number of platforms, which are sometimes called gatekeeper platforms in continental Europe or, or platforms with strategic market status in the UK. So instances of abuse of dominance, uh, instances of antitrust violations, questions around uh, patterns of acquisitions which have, but it is debated, which have perhaps in some cases led to uh, the squashing of, of rivals and new entrants. Uh, the report, one of the, one of the unique aspects of this report is it's not just about antitrust and competition, it looks at also the effect on society and in particular effect on work and employment. So I, I, I listened with a lot of interest in Niklas talk earlier and was very pleased to hear um, that, um, you know, uh, uh, delivery um, workers have a choice as to whether they're treated as contractors or, 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 or employees. And uh, because a lot of, a lot of uh, platforms actually uh, um, systematically avoid uh, regulation um, and, and, and avoid carrying the social cost uh, that are traditionally reserved to, to, to employees. Uh, of course, the positive aspect of this is that they can reduce their cost, but the negative is that someone has to pay for that cost. And there is a social cost associated with that in terms of precarity, in terms of, 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 of the cost that is, or the risk that is shifted to the individual that performs the work and that has consequences. So risk shifted to workers, also um, uh, an ongoing surveillance and control of workers. So obviously everything has a positive and a negative, the digital technologies and connectivities facilitate the monitoring and the control of assets and human resources as well, uh, without having them uh, located inside 
the same location or even being part of the same firm. So, 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 so what we see now is uh, uh, we've seen that online platforms can generate a lot of value, but we see the limits of some of that models. And so uh, workers ongoing uh, surveillance and control and lack of collective organization and a lot of precarity. So there's also effect on societal risk. I'm not going to go into detail. We've all heard about risk around privacy. The, so the question, the thorny issue of online harms, very hard to regulate what is legal in one country is not legal in, in another. Just think about, for example, saying something against religion. Um, are we going towards a surveillance society, which is what Jaron Lanier and in particular Shoshana Zuboff are complaining about? And what is the effect of fake news or, and polarization? So we know there are a lot of of, of, of problematic effects there. Uh, the challenges in terms of regulation is that uh, you see that you see that none of these issues falls neatly within one body of regulation. Not everything can be solved by updating antitrust. Not everything can be solved by just looking at privacy rules. And um, you have limits of traditional antitrust, issues around data and accumulation of data involving violation of privacy and competition, but also in some cases a systematic avoidance of sectoral regulation in addition to illegal or sometimes harmful content. I will not go into the details of the policy options just to say that the report um, um, uh, proposes that the regulation uh, is built on the basis of positive principles that are pro-competitive, uh, ensuring freedom of competition, uh, strengthening competition rules for merger control, ensuring fairness of intermediation, sovereignty of decision making. And, and uh, so the report says that it is in favor of um, uh, the DMA and the DSA. It says that it goes in the right direction. It proposes some uh, punctual uh, um, 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 questions and, and it, it highlights some uh, possible problems um, in the in the in the way it is going to be implemented, and I would like very much to say that the devil will be in the detail about how it will be implemented. One one particular suggestion is that instead of having a monolithic code of conduct that should be applied to all the all the gatekeepers platform, it would be it would be a lot better to follow the the, the UK route to have to have a codes of conduct that will be uh, customized for each of those gatekeeper platforms, because where interoperability would make a lot of sense on some issues for one particular platform, it really wouldn't make sense for another. So, so um, because there are not going to be a, a large number of gatekeepers, it will be feasible and, and, and very important, I believe, to do so. Uh, Mrs. Dion Courtin also mentioned the role earlier of, of national authorities. I think uh, the current proposal doesn't really leave a lot of room for national authorities, but some of them have uh, gone beyond. So I think it's important not to diminish the role of the national authorities. So just to summarize, um, uh, and I will just uh, build, uh, uh, just focus your attention on the on the right uh, left corner here. Uh, I agree with what uh, Mrs. Jean Courtin have said and 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 Max Bevet and Palmer. There is a this is a very opportune moment uh, where a new kind of dialogue has to happen between big tech platforms, regulators, um, and also other members within this this community. I, I see this uh, this uh, this uh, afternoon's panel in that direction. I was very pleased to see that uh, there are there are people from uh, you know all over, um, not only the world but different kinds of roles participating into this into this framework. There has to be this constructive dialogue between the DMA um, uh, and DSA, uh, the regulators and the big tech platforms, and more more collaboration across silos. So I will stop here. I, I think I exceeded my time, but not bad going for 150 pages. So thank you. Um, thank you very much, Annabelle. Uh, again, a kind of really interesting presentation and insight into, um, into your work. Um, there's a few themes I want to pick up on there in, in a minute on kind of pro-competition, on innovation, on, on cooperation, co-creation. Um, but to live what you said as live this kind of uh, live dialogue, um, I'm going to kind of introduce Oliver Bethel, who is head of competition uh, Emir at Google. So, um, I, I, Oliver, I um, I kind of want you to kind of give us some reflections on what's been said before. But I think when you might you might often come to these events and expect somebody for Google to say the traditional thing about kind of they don't want to see the DMA or DSA or against regulation. But 
um, you might have a different view. What, what are the positives of the new legislation and, and how can we think more creatively about this um, whole process? Thanks a, thanks a lot, Max. Can you hear and see me? Okay, lucky you. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and to share the panel with um, such knowledgeable experts also. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're quite right, Max. I mean, I, I think, and, and Stephanie nodded to this in our remarks, I think the, the, the expectation is <clears throat> that big tech will tell you that the, there's no regulation needed. The current rules suffice. Uh, and anything that we're going to do is, uh, is going to have a chilling effect. That's not my view. Uh, for sure. And it's not the view of, of my team at Google or, or Google more generally, that's the highest levels. Um, I think there are a, a number of significant opportunities for Google in uh, the, the new regulations that are being considered at various levels within Europe, but in the DMA, uh, as we're talking about that today. I think there are real opportunities. Uh, I think there is some devil in the detail. Uh, I think there is some uncertainty as we go, but that shouldn't put us off. And there are uh, places where um, we can be very creative. You know, I, I lived through the shopping case for those 10 years or so. Uh, and there are certainly places where one can derive efficiencies that are going to be beneficial to, to all stakeholders. So I think there are a number of big opportunities. I want to focus just on my, in my five minutes on, on three things that I think will be important to us. First of all, and this is a rather obvious point, forgive me, but the ability to make faster decisions for me to give clearer advice earlier in the life cycle of a product. I mean, the nuts and bolts of my role is, is talking to engineers, uh, talking to product designers, uh, user interface designers, uh, and helping them make quick decisions. And the, the clearer I can be, the earlier I can be in that process, the more effective I can be. And there are often multiple routes for us to take. Uh, it may not be you know, the, the one terrible route or nothing. There may be a lots of different shades of gray, different points in the process. So having greater clarity is going to be helpful. It will not be. Uh, it will enable us to be more efficient, I believe, in the decision making. Just by way of illustration, last year, we, we ran around 600,000 experiments at Google. And often those, increasingly, they're coming to my team. So the more clarity I have, the more of an ability I have to give clear advice, the better. Uh, I think that's in the interest of Google and its users and the partners that we work with, because Oftentimes we're thinking about decisions of, you know, this will be a launch of a product that's going to be immediately visible to European consumers. There'll be partners uh, within the ecosystem we want to work with. So being able to be fast is going to be advantageous to us. So we should lean into that opportunity, I believe. The second big opportunity uh, is, to be quite frank, to dispel some myths. Uh, this is a debate. The public discourse around some of these issues often feels like it's uh, on both sides, on all sides led by a tweet and I think we reduce the, the positions to slogans and we kind of shout past one another often in these debates and from my perspective there's a real opportunity for Google if we can build the right kind of regulatory framework the right kind of opportunities for dialogue to dispel some of those myths we will have to change in some ways but there will be places where the facts have been misrepresented where I can provide greater clarity I can bring engineers to a debate I can bring executives to a debate so I better understand what we're doing. I think that's a real opportunity. Uh, I've experienced it organically with the commission over years in the cases that I've worked on with DG Comp. And I would love to see more of those kinds of opportunities for us to dispel this. Finally, uh, uh, this takes place in the global context. Clearly, this debate this is not Euro specific. Uh, and I think it's a real opportunity for uh, Europe. Um, but obviously, you can tell, tell where I'm from. I'm married to a Finn. Uh, I, I'm very interested in this being used as an opportunity to model a practicable, sensible approach for the rest of the world. I really think it has that potential. Um, I don't think that we'll necessarily align on all of the underlying values. They will vary, you know, across different jurisdictions. That's quite natural, I think, and normal. Uh, some areas will be more complicated than others. As Stephanie nodded to the, the DSA in particular, some very interesting sort of issues there where the value systems may vary jurisdiction by jurisdiction somewhat. But there will be places, I believe, where, let's say, the functional aspects of what we can build can be exported. They can be flexible. They can be used in other environments. And it's a real opportunity for us. Uh, what in particular? Well, four, four things in particular I see in the DMA that I think, if done properly, could be very useful for us globally. First of all, categorizing the different types of concerns, being honest with ourselves that there are some things 
now we can say are always bad. We can identify that prohibiting uh, your partners from talking to a competition agency, right? That's clearly something you want to ban. There will be things that are so uh, obviously bad that we want to ban them. But there will be things where we're uncertain. And I think that's fine. But I think we have to build a framework for assessing those things. That doesn't necessarily mean that we have to build out a 10 year, 15 year uh, effects based analysis, but we can there be creative. How do we deal with uncertainty? What kinds of discussions would we like to have happen between the agencies and the companies? Who would we like to have consulted? What kinds of compliance organizations would we want to have within a company like Google? These are all kind of practical questions that I think we should wrestle with. Um, how do we accommodate? Boundary disputes, uh, it's my, my sort of you know, uh, uh, shorthand for a point that Annabelle, Annabelle made quite rightly, which is that the, the DMA deals with contestability, but I can find contestability as, a, as an expression, as a goal across multiple different types of legislation. How do we deal with those boundary disputes? I think that the, the European Union has been very adept, adept at thinking about those kinds of issues. And again, is a sort of exportable attribute of what we could achieve here. Um, finally, just very quickly, Remedies. I think this is perhaps a part of the, the DMA where we haven't talked much, um, but we could do more. I think we can think about using this process to think very seriously about what kinds of remedies, what kinds of solutions would we want to deploy uh, more quickly in the digital space. I think there's work around choice screens, there's audits of the kinds of remedies that we've seen today that may well inform how we want to think about solutions in the future. You know, particularly if we're in areas where there's some uncertainty as to the nature of the harm, can we learn things in Europe that are going to be helpful when we think about remedies that we might want to deploy quickly, iteratively in Europe, and then think about exporting some of those models globally. So that's a very quick whistle stop tour. Some ideas I have, I do think there are opportunities, uh, and, and I think that companies such as ours should lean into them. Thanks very much, Oliver. Um, an interesting, interesting summary. I, I might come to you first, actually, for a question, which is um, there's a bit, bit of a debate in the chat about, um, I guess, the pro-competitive nature of some of these new regulations. And everybody on all sides wants, says they want to see kind of more competition, but um, what that means can be very different things to people. So if we think about Europe and the strength of the European platform economy, um, what do you see of the opportunities in this legislation um, to improve the overall ecosystem uh, and to bring more European platforms um, into an environment where they can be profitable and serve consumers in new and interesting ways? So that's a good question. I think that look, there are, as we work through, I think certainly there, as I, as I said in my opening remarks there, I think there are going to be a set of things potentially where we may want to say to platforms such as Google that we just don't want this kind of thing to happen. It so manifestly raises a barrier to entry. You can see there's never going to be any reasonable justification for this particular act. So let's just get rid of those things. Let's clear that brushwood. Um, we're familiar with that kind of distinction between ex ante, ex post in, in different areas of law. It seems quite sensible to think of the things that would have those attributes. Spoiler alert, I don't think there are a lot of things that are so obviously bad, typically bad, and definable as such that we want to put in that bucket. But I think that the concept of that bucket is, is quite sensible. As you move past that to areas of, of, of more uncertainty, and of course, there will always be a spectrum. There will be some things where you want to ask Google one or two questions, and then very quickly you'll have made a decision one way or the other. There are things where you'll want to spend a few weeks thinking about an issue, and that I think it's important to bear that uncertainty spectrum in mind. None of these things really fit neatly into this Article 5, this is Article 6. There will be shades of grey, and then we have to draw distinctions somewhere, but there will always be shades of grey. But across those more uncertain concerns, there are measures that you can obviously sort of start to think about ramping up, uh, commensurate with the nature of the concern and the evidence that you have to, to justify that concern. For example, if we do not understand how components in an integrated distribution network, for example, work together, and we have some concerns because they are all owned, all components within that network are owned by one company, or at least the, the principal products in that, in that uh, distribution network. Let's start by understanding what's going on, right? Let's make it very, very clear that that company has to uh, explain to us to, to, to some degree, and maybe to the public to a lesser degree, depending on what's in that disclosure, how do these processes work? How do online auctions work? 
right? What's the data? Let us understand how these things are operated. So I think there's a, a flavor of transparency that's already going to be helpful in a lot of areas. Ad tech is a, is a key area, for, uh, a key example in my experience, I think at the moment, for where that would be helpful. Uh, interoperability, data portability, moving away from, to, to, from to transport answer across the spectrum. There will be places clearly where we identify that there are uh, uh, entering or expanding entities who are going to bring contestability to the market and there's something they really need. Let's think about what that would look like, right? What do those APIs need to look like? What are the costs to a company like Google to provide those kinds of APIs, that sort of data portability? And then you get to, you know, the more extreme remedies. No, I don't think anyone should take this off the table uh, per se. Right? It seems sensible to have all of the options available as they are today to some extent under the perhaps longer process of, of an antitrust enforcement case. But there are, are, are stronger interventions. There are divestitures. Uh, there are all sorts of things that you can think at the more extreme end of the spectrum. Uh, and I think all of those uh, measures properly deployed with the right kind of regulatory debate, regulatory dialogue leading to the ultimate decision and all of the concomitant points of appeal will create opportunities, opportunities for Google, opportunities for new entrants. Right, that's interesting. I, I might actually ask a very similar question, but from a have the perspective to uh, Stephanie on Catan. Um, so there's an interesting question, Stephanie, in the uh, in the chat um, about. Um, I guess when you you talked about pro being pro competition as well, but there's a risk with all of these proposals that the big players are able to adapt much easier than the um, smaller players. So in trying to be pro competitive, you might actually end up creating more barriers to SMEs and new entrants. Could you reflect on that and say if you think that's a kind of true reflection or not? Well, yeah. In fact, there are many, many interesting questions within the uh, the chat, and this is one of the very inter inter interesting one. What I've already uh, said is that the, the the proposal of the commission so far is um, dedicated to uh, address you know the regulation to a handful of companies, you know, namely the big techs, and the idea is just to uh, open and to provide for a level playing field for any uh, of the companies, including the SMEs, uh, for which you know the market is is essential. But this big tech, because of the their behavior uh, play uh, and act as gatekeeper and, and prevent the other ones like you know other businesses SMEs and consumers for entering the market so the key element of this regulation as I said earlier is that uh, we as co-legislators the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers are now working on the many loopholes and many uh, uh, amendments to bring to the current proposal of the Commission. And, and they are, of course, given the fast moving uh, markets in digital, there are many, many things to have in mind. And I think the key elements of this is, um, and I think Oliver and Annabelle um, uh, you know, highlighted this very well, uh, security and legal certainty you know, for any, um, any players in this market and flexibility also of the regulation. You know, we're going, I mean, it's a, it's a good step, this DMA, but it's not, um, as uh, in, in my view, it's not sufficient. For example, the commission adopted, uh, adopted a horizontal approach to have a flexible and future-proof instrument. And but however, introducing an approach by business model could allow a more targeted uh, you know, approach and many regulation or remedies, for instance, how do you define an active user to reach the quantitative threshold, depending on your business model, you cannot define them the same way, you know, you have many, many markets within the digital one. So having to wait for dele delegated act to know more is not particularly particularly satisfactory in terms of legal process. So we have to make sure that we have clear rules and future proof as well, uh, given the fast moving, uh, moving world. And again, it's not a regulation against uh, companies. It's a regulation for all the companies to be able to compete online as they do offline. Thank you. Yeah, that's a uh, it's a great summary, and I think the yeah future proof pro competition um, piece of legislation is what we can all agree on. And um, I think that's actually what lots of countries around the world are looking at at the moment. And Annabelle, if I if I turn to you, um, so we've got competition and antitrust being discussed in the U.S., the U.K., and, and Europe, and you've got a unique insight into what we can learn from those different processes. What's the potential for global collaboration and, and, and what are the risks if we end up with 
highly divergent regimes for mm. multinational companies or any European company that wants to bring its platform to the rest of the world? Yeah, well, look, I, I think that's a fantastically important question. I'm not really optimistic about a successful uh, regulatory alignment between, you know, China, Europe, and the US. Uh, I, I just don't think it's gonna, it's gonna happen. Um, obviously, uh, you have different regions, you have different uh, objectives. Obviously, I would say the US, Europe, and the UK are certainly more aligned, but, but um, in a way, the, 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 the big online platforms, um, they are the most global uh, aligned organization all across the world, right? So they are facing the difficulty of a misaligned uh, regulatory regimes, right? What's really interesting is that these companies themselves are becoming, in a way, kind of regulators. They are private regulators. They are governors of their own ecosystem. And so in a relatively short period of time, historically, you've had these organizations which just in a blink of an eye, you know, I remember just, just 10, 20 years ago, startups, mavericks, young graduates coming out of university, you know, breaking havoc and disrupting industries. And then 20 years later, uh, more powerful than many governments, society looks to them to sort out issues that they were not built to sort out. You know, and I do have a little bit, I, I do have a, an understanding when, you know, CEOs of those companies says, you know, I don't want to be the arbiter of truth. Obviously nobody, that's not what was the plan, but some of these companies have been victim of their own success. That is, they have really, uh, ahead of the pack, they have understood how to tap into the potential of the digital uh, economy to create value in a particular way. And they're at the edge of this envelope. And therefore, we are all realizing now that these issues cannot be solved only by private regulators. And I think that's why I appreciate very much Oliver's nuanced stance on this, right? We need to move beyond this sort of money case, black and white, I'm right, you're wrong, sort of, you know, talking past each other. It's just too important. Uh, and, 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 and therefore, and therefore, there are some issues that are better left to be governed by, el by democratically elected, you know, representative. And we do not live in a world where we have a world government is perhaps a good thing, right? So those issues that have to be better dealt with by elected representative, well, they're gonna have to be addressed by the institutions, the political institutions that we have. There are issues around the scope of those institutions, you know, Brexit just showed us, you know, the scope of Europe, the interoperability issues between Ireland and the rest. These are these are these are these are the institutions that we have. Other issues, um, you know, will be better resolved within the governance system of of these private companies. Mm. But what we are witnessing now is a is a shifting of the lines. Yeah. I think that's that's a that's a great way to end this um, panel actually to say that I mean we're all regulators now and um, each each player in this discussion has their own responsibilities and we need to work together to make sure we create a framework that ultimately works better for consumers and citizens and um, creates a more optimistic future. So I am optimistic about uh, the strength of um, collaboration that is possible in this space. Um, so thank you very much to um, Stephanie Yonkantin, Annabelle Gower and Oliver Bethel for a very interesting discussion and panel. Back to you, Petra. Thank you, Max, Stephanie, Annabelle and Oliver. Um, you've made regulation so understandable, which is not a small feast. And it is definitely a topic that will remain in the limelight for some time to come still. Um, so perhaps another follow on chapter. Thank you.